Hello, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the Celebrating Sims exhibit at the Harrisonburg High School. This exhibit has been made possible through a grant from the Virginia Humanities. My name is Ember Heishman, and I'm going to be your host today. Although it's a pity we can't gather in person to launch the exhibit at the Harrisonburg High School, being here on Zoom means that people from all over the world are able to join us and celebrate. So thank you all for attending our virtual roundtable. In just a second, we're going to get to have a chat with our roundtable panelists, all of these people you see on the screen. Yeah, go ahead and wave. <laughs> um, but before we do that, and I introduce them, and we get to have a conversation, we're delighted to present a short video that will provide us with some context for the history and purpose of the exhibit, as well as offer us a first look at the newly finished installation at the Harrisonburg High School. So give me just a second to get my screen set up here. And then we'll go ahead. My name is Dina Reed, and I am the current mayor of Harrisonburg. I grew up here, and I went to Harrisonburg High School. But before my day, Black students in Harrisonburg and the surrounding counties went to separate schools. Back in the day, they went to the Effinger Street School. And then from the 1930s through the 60s, they went to the Lucy F. Sims School, which is now the Lucy F. Sims Continuing Education Center. Lucy F. Sims was a woman who was born enslaved, raised on a plantation in Harrisonburg, and then after the end of slavery, went on to get her education at the Hampton Institute alongside Booker T. Washington. She returned to Rockingham County to teach over 1,800 students across three generations, including many of my own relatives, and to become one of the most celebrated educators in the state. For a long time, the history of Lucy F. Sims and the school named in her honor lived in the memories of our elders. But in 2015, an exhibit celebrating this history was unveiled in the Lucy F. Sims Center for Continuing Education. The exhibit was a collaboration between 56 community partners and students and professors from James Madison University. Today, I am proud to unveil a version of that exhibit here in Harrisonburg High School. The exhibit tells the story of education in the black community in Harrisonburg from after the Civil War until the present day. It builds on the photographs and research of many local historians, including Bill O'Harper, Doris Harper Allen, Ruth Tolliver, Robin Lytle, Dale McAllister, and many others. We learn about the life of Miss Sims, the amazing creativity and quality of the education that students received at the Lucy F. Sims School, and we learn about the many ways in which the school played a central part in the lives of families in the Northeast neighborhood of Harrisonburg and beyond. Having this important exhibit here in the Central Atrium will help our current and future students understand our shared history here in Harrisonburg and in the counties beyond. For a long time, African-American history has been separate and secondary. And there's a state effort to correct that. We will put many hours into rewriting curriculum and figuring out how to put African-American history accurately in the center of our curriculum. So we're very excited about the exhibit being here in the building because now we have the ability of uh, students just to go downstairs and learn about the impact of Miss Sims and learn about the history of education in our area. And many of our kids have parents, grandparents, and other relatives that are part of this exhibit. And so when students are able to internalize uh, the history, it becomes much more meaningful and valuable for them. The sacrifices and, and what impact she hit on generations of kids the, the impact of what she did for the community was late coming. I'm very proud that this uh, exhibit now will just improve or increase on her legacy. The exhibit continues to be open to the general public at the Sim Center for Continuing Education on the website and as a traveling exhibit. 
The unveiling of the exhibit here at Harrisonburg High will ensure that students for generations to come will know of Ms. Sims and the extraordinary history of education and resilience in our community. All right, welcome back everyone. Um, we hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, many thanks to Signs USA for creating the panels and to the Harrisonburg High School team for installing them in the high school. And many, many thanks to Appeal Productions for their excellent work on the video for getting us ready for today. Um, with that, let's go ahead and move on to our conversation about Ms. Sims and her legacy and the rich history of education in the black community here in Harrisonburg and the surrounding cities. On our panel today, we have, and wave when I introduce you, um, Molly Godfrey, Associate Professor of English, Co-Director of Celebrating Sims, Sean McCarthy, Associate Professor of Writing, Rhetoric, and Technical Communication, Co-Director of Celebrating Sims, Dina Reed, Mayor of Harrisonburg, Virginia, Michael Richards, Superintendent of Harrisonburg City Public Schools, Kirk Moyers, Social Studies Coordinator for Harrisonburg City Public Schools, Don Burgess, teacher and varsity boys basketball coach for Harrisonburg High School, and Colleen Morris, counseling secretary for Harrisonburg High School. We were also supposed to have former Lucy F. Sims School student Betty Buck join us today, but unfortunately she can't make it due to technical difficulties. We're all disappointed you can't be with us today, Betty, but we know you're with us in spirit, and thanks to Betty's daughter Lenora for recording this session so that Betty can view it later. I'm going to start by asking each of our panelists one question each, and then we'll open it up to all of you um, on the call for questions and comments. Um, if you do have a question for a particular panelist as they're speaking, don't hesitate to pop it into the Zoom Q&A box. Um, and I can go ahead and check that question for you. Um, let's start with Drs. Molly Godfrey and Sean McCarthy. Can you guys tell us how this project came to be? What was the process like? Sure, I'll start. Thank you, Ember, and thank you everyone for joining us. Can everyone see me now? Okay. Um, so this is uh, kind of emotional watching that video. This project has been um, going on for a long time. We started six years ago. Um, I was working with Robin Lytle at the Shenandoah Valley Black Heritage Project. Um, and we were working on a couple of small projects. We wanted to keep working together and we knew that there was a real community interest in preserving the history of the Lucy F. Sims School and Miss Sims, but also actually telling that story and, and preserving that story on the walls of the former school, which is now a continuing education center, a Lucy F. Sims continuing education center. Um, so we wanted to do this project and quickly realized it was a really big project. <laughs> um, I went to the Institute for Creative Inquiry at JMU to see if there was a way to run the project as a class. And they connected me with Sean McCarthy who quickly came on board and became co-director of the project. Together with Robin, um, we formed an advisory board of former Sims students um, that included Doris Harper Allen, Wilhelmina Johnson, Howard Curry, who you saw in the video, and, and many others. We also partnered with Billow Harper, Doris Harper Allen's son, who had earlier created a documentary about the school a few years prior. Um, it ended up being at least a three semester project. We spent a semester um, forming our advisory board, forming um, over 50 community partnerships and applying for grants. We spent a semester working with a team of student interns who did, um, who worked with local historians, did archival research, scanned family photographs, and spent time listening to former Sims students' stories and memories. And then we spent a semester, a very fast paced semester, um, working with 16 students and very collaboratively with our advisory board to, to craft the narrative of the Sims exhibit going back and forth. It was um, very much a story that was driven by our advisory board's um, vision. Um, this, the exhibit itself was, this, I think, 
officially installed in 2016, permanently installed, and it's still there today. You can see it um, on the walls of the Lucy F. Sims Continuing Education Center. It's open to the public. Um, and we also, at the same time in 2016, published a companion website, which features a bunch of supplementary materials, including curricular um, lesson plans, timelines, and maps. So a goal of the original SIMS project was to increase the collaborative research and reciprocity among different community groups, such as the uh, SIMS school alumni, the Northeast Neighborhood Association, and teachers and students in local schools. So we got some clear feedback from our collaborators, is that, and they wanted to see the project extended and in more spaces. So this exhibit that's opening today is itself a celebration of all those collaborations. And we're particularly grateful to Harrisonburg Hive, to uh, for High School for getting for, for, for today and for working with us to get it up in the walls. Now in the exhibit, we touch upon the importance of communities beyond Harrisonburg because students um, historically were sent to the Sim schools from neighboring towns or like from different counties away, like they used to travel for over an hour, maybe two hours a day to get to the school. So we thought that in this phase two of the project that it was important that those communities got to experience the exhibit too, which is why that alongside the high school opening that we have today, we're also going to have a traveling version of the exhibit and that'll hopefully be going around the state in the coming years. So the first stop of the mobile exhibit will be in Massanutten Mass Regional Library. And um, when the pandemic numbers are in our favor, we hope to uh, open the exhibit there in early March. Um, we wouldn't be here today, this project wouldn't be here today without the help of Virginia Humanities. And I think I, think I see David and Carolyn here, so thanks for visiting with us. Uh, one of the aspects of the project that we talked about a lot with the Virginia Humanities crew was increasing the general re generational reach outreach of the project. So what we mean by that is to make the exhibit permanently available to, to current and to future generations, right? So Harrisonburg High School students, teachers, and their families to give them a, an opportunity to learn about the SIM school and the history of black education in Harrisonburg and beyond. So you haven't heard the end of this project. We're gonna keep going with it, aren't we, Dina? We're just gonna keep powering ahead with, as, uh, with other projects in the upcoming years. In fact, we just, I just wanna give a, a, a chance to, to, to shout out for a couple of events that are coming up. Uh, we're hosting a program on March 4th um, at 7 p.m. on Zoom with Dale McAllister and Bo Dickinson, who I see in the room here, uh, where Dale will talk about his book and they will have a discussion about the importance of this kind of history in our local schools. So we'll throw up some details about on Facebook and on our website about that. And finally, we found a little wiggle room in our Virginia Humanities budget to get the entire exhibit translated into Spanish. And we're going to have audio versions of the exhibit, both in English and in Spanish, where visitors can put up their phones to a QR code and listen along as they're looking at the actual panel. So we're really excited about that. We're not entirely sure how it's going to work yet, but we're going to figure that out in the next month or two. And the English version will be narrated by none other than Mayor Dina Reed. So uh, thanks for that. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Ember. Thank you, Dr. Godfrey and McCarthy. Um, on to Mayor Dina Reed. Um, you've been involved in this project for a pretty long time, and we want to know what your experience has been like. Yeah, so first it was, um, thank you so much uh, for having me on the panel uh, today. And watching that video was, and it was a little uh, overwhelming. Um, it was incredible to be part of this project. Um, being there, I remember um, when we first met, uh, we met up at Sim School in one of the, um, one of the uh, rooms, conference rooms. Um, and being there with the uh, former students, my elders, uh, uh, as they were uh, looking through um, old pictures and sharing stories about um, Lucy Sims, Miss Lucy, as they called her, Miss Lucy as a teacher, and their experiences as students at Sim School. Um, the rich history, uh, the rich Black history was at times, it was just overwhelming for me um, just to be in the room and to hear. Um, I had no idea what the outcome was going to be um, in the initial phase of us gathering, but to finally see the exhibit uh, was simply stunning. Um, it was like uh, Miss Lucy, the teachers, uh, 
faculty and the students that their voices were speaking from the, the, from the exhibit, from every panel. Um, and so they actually, they really did, the former students uh, gave life to this exhibit. So um, it, it was just, it's just an overwhelming experience. And I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to be a part of it. Thank you, that was lovely. And I definitely relate looking at a lot of the metadata that we've gotten, seeing the pictures that people have donated, just wanting to share their stories. It's been really cool. Um, on to Dr. Richards. The exhibit has been publicly available at the Sim Center since 2015, but it's now being installed in the Atrium of Harrisonburg High School. What do you hope current and future students will learn from passing this exhibit every day in the hall? So thank you for that question, Ember, and thanks everybody for this um, project. JMU, my own staff, um, Dina, thank you so much. So I, I said in the video, my global answer to that, my global answer is that African American history has been secondary and separate, and we need to make it primary and central, and we need to make it accurate and authentic. We need to activate and 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 um, empower voices of our African American students to do that kind of history and all of our students to do that kind of history. So the second part of my answer, which is more local, is I want all students to see that they can make a difference in their community. You know, we study these historical figures and they're mainly national, they're international and so forth. But I want our own students to see that they can make this kind of difference like Lucy Sims did, that they can be passionate and dedicated and to their community and do this kind of work. And especially our black and brown students. I want them to see their faces, you know, in history books and on the walls. As a white male, I've seen my face everywhere, right? In history books, on the walls of Capitol buildings and so forth. I've never questioned that I can be a leader that can affect my community. But I want all of our students to feel that. I want all of our students, especially our black and brown students, to see that as they walk into their own high school. So that's that's kind of my global and my local answer. Thank you for asking. Wow, thank you so much. That was a lovely answer. <laughs> um, next up, we have a question for Mr. Moyers. And we want to know, can you tell us how teachers are teaching using the exhibit and the companion website in their curriculum and where the value is in that? Um, yeah, and there, I think there's, there's multiple parts to that answer. Um, one of the things that wasn't mentioned is before we, before we actually had the panels on the wall, we had kind of a, a, a copy of what was in the Sims building uh, that teachers could use. It was just up on the walls. And one of the things that really struck me was just even in, in class changes and kids being in the halls, uh, the number of students that would just stop and look and read and ask questions. And in many cases say, hey, that's my grandma in that picture or that's, um, that's my great aunt or you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and so to answer your question, I think that um, we can use it in multiple ways. Uh, the, the website has some awesome curriculum uh, that, that we can use and that we have used with it, with our, our mobile exhibit, if you will, uh, where we're connecting some of those things that we teach in US history and in government courses, we're connecting those things to what that looked like here in Harrisonburg and, and what are those voices that, that are, are local that we can um, that we can get our local history from and, and determine what these big global or national events look like at, a, at the local scale. Because as, as I said in the video, I think that when a lot of times when we teach history, it's just this thing that's out there. But when you have some way of connecting that to kids and when they see, especially sometimes their family members there and you're like, oh, that's what that's about. Uh, it builds this connection. It's just awesome. Um, and and I, the other part about where it is in the building uh, that I think is super valuable is now, I mean, that's a, a very heavy traffic area for our school. And so now you're going to have lots of people just stopping. And I've already seen it just in the, in the couple of weeks it's been up. 
people stopping and looking and reading and, and they're learning about the history, the local history uh, and the history of our African-American community. And that's something that has been missing from our schools for so long. Um, so I'm just, I'm thrilled that it's up and, and we're gonna be able to, to incorporate it into our curriculum. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we do have another question for both Ms. Morris and for Mr. Burge. Um, you both work at the school and have family members who went to the Sims school. What does it mean to you that the exhibit is now being installed in the high school atrium? Um, it makes me proud to see my mother, who was a teacher at Sims, honored and remembered. She is in two of the pictures on the wall and also two teachers, Mrs. Arrington, Mrs. Blakey, and an administrative assistant, Mrs. Jones, who were at the old high school when I attended Harrisonburg High School. Their photos are also on the wall. A lot of current students of HHS have family members in these pictures as well, which is a happy moment for them too. My nieces, my nephews who are attending Harrisonburg High School and some that will be coming will be able to see their relatives being honored as well. This project is finally finished, which was started a few years ago with the conversation with, conversation with Kirk Moyers and Mrs. Borg and myself in the social studies hall. Thank you all who made this happen. Thank you, Don. Uh, yes, uh, and once again, uh, just to reiterate, great job with uh, this project. Thank you, uh, Molly and Sean and everybody involved, Dr. Richards, Mayor Dina Reed. Thank you all, uh, Kirk Moyers. Uh, as he had mentioned earlier, Mr. Moyers, they used to have the, the photos down the hallway in the history hallway. And uh, to, to answer the question, what, what does it mean in regards to this exhibit? Just so much pride and joy. With me being born and raised, you know, I get emotional just talking about it and excited. Um, born and raised on the northeast section of Harrisonburg. Uh, my father, cousin, Bundy's band, that's cousins. One of the photos that uh, the camera was going through. I saw Roscoe Burgess Jr. down on the corner. It was in the choir. And it's just so much pride and joy that it brings because as Dr. Richards has said, I'm a product of Waterman Elementary School, Thomas Harrison Middle School, Harrisonburg High School. We didn't see black and brown as future leaders in those history books. And for our kids to be able to see this, not just when they went down the history hallway, but now when they walk into the atrium of Harrisonburg High School, that's just so empowering. It gives them an opportunity like, you know what? I can do this. And, and as uh, Ms. Morris and Dina Reed have mentioned, with us uh, being from the area, seeing family and friends like my father, uh, he's up in one of the photos. And it's just great just seeing those. We were called the youngins, as Ms. Dina Reed has said. They were the old heads. And to see those old heads in no disrespect, but that's how it was up in our, in our community. You had the old heads who reached back and empowered us and gave us the knowledge. And, and every time my wife and I, we lived out of town, we would come back to, to Harrisonburg. I always made sure I drove past Sam School because I know how much that meant to me. But more importantly, my father and other relatives, they walked from Bridgewater to Harrison, to Lucy F. Sam School. That was just that, that little sense of pride. So now um, when I'm at the high school, uh, and, and one last quick story, when I became a teacher and educator and coach at Harrisburg High School, I used to go up past the history hallway, Mr. Moyer's office was down there, just to see the folks from my Northeast section and be like, yes, sir, I'm here in the schoolhouse. And it just gave me an extra sense of pride, uh, joy, and just an honor to be able to be uh, considered a role model came out of the Northeast section, and now doing the things that we're doing, Miss Morris, Miss Reed, and I can go on with numerous other ones. And it, if it wasn't for Miss uh, Miss Lucy F. Sims, allowing our parents, relatives to do their thing and get their education, we, us three right here wouldn't be where we are. And so um, I appreciate this, uh, th this, th this visual. 
that you all are putting up in a first class manner in the hallways of uh, Harrison Murray High School. Now, you know, I'm gonna I'm have to mess up things right now, I'm sorry. But um, when Don and Colleen were talking, so Colleen and I, Don, Don's a little younger, not that much, but Colleen and I went to high school together. Um, and so for the three of us, right, this is so special um, because what Don was saying is exactly right. When we went to high school, uh, we didn't really see ourselves in the history books, right? Or if we did see ourselves, it was in a bad light. Um, and so the just being able to walk the halls of Harrisonburg High School and be able to see your family members and friends and people who I always say had their hands on us when we were growing up, right? Just to see them featured in the atrium of the of the school. And I have to thank uh, Dr. Richards and the school board um, for seeing the importance of putting the, the exhibit in the atrium. So when you first walk through the high school, it starts with Miss Lucy and it goes all the way back to the cafeteria. That's phenomenal, right? Because we could have just put it up in the social study hallway, but it was, it, it was bigger than that. And it meant more to that because those black and brown students that you talk about Dr. Richards can see themselves. And not only that, they see their family, right? There's a lot of Harrisonburg high school students that are from the neighborhood that can look up there and see their grandparents, their aunts, right? And it's, it's just, um, it's just incredible. It, this is overwhelming for, for us three. I, I know it is for Don and, and for Colleen um, for us to, to be involved with this, but finally to see it um, so that our kids um, can learn the local history because we have a rich history here in Harrisonburg um, for them to learn more about who they are and who the people were who are in their families and who, um, who are part of the Northeast. Um, community. So this is very special. So thank you to Dr. Richards and the school board for allowing us to put it front and center, right, of the high school. Sorry, I didn't mean to take over. No, that was wonderful. This is a conversation, right? Um, and with that, we have um, all the questions that we had planned, we've gotten through. So if anyone else has questions, go ahead and pop them into our Q&A. Um, or I see some coming in in the chat. So um, we actually did have one come in a little while ago from Lance L. Burgess Jr., who says he's related to two of you. And I know we've touched on this a little bit, but um, maybe we can clarify how long this project took from you know its conception to where we are now with launching our second exhibit and a traveling exhibit. I suppose I can try to answer that. I mean, the, so the original, the time it took from the original conception to the launch at the Sim Center, I would say was about a year and a half, um, you know, a, a sort of six months of community, you know, partnership building and um, six months of research and six months of um, co-creation. And um, almost as soon as it was up on the walls, there were more stories coming out, <laughs> you know, um, where's this person, where's this photograph, what about this story? Um, and so we uh, maybe took a little, like a little break <laughs> and then st immediately started, um, you know, just um, trying to speak to uh, people about what else they wanted and what more we could do. And I think it was through that process, which was probably a two-year process, we had surveys and consultations and meetings and conversations. Um, to figure out that an important next step was bringing this to future generations, bringing the story to future generations, and also to the counties, which is what the traveling exhibit hopes to do. Um, but we're still working. Dina and uh, Sean and I are meeting with Stephanie Howard, who's the Sims uh, Center supervisor and a huge supporter of this project next week to think about how we might honor, um, you know, incredible former Sims students in, in other new ways on the walls of the Sim Center. And so we're just gonna keep, we're gonna keep listening and keep going. Um, but yeah, it was six, so, so a year and a half before the, um, 
the exhibit went up on the walls of the Sim Center and it's been six years now between when the project started and this exhibit going up at Harrisonburg High School. It's also worth mentioning during that six years that uh, the, the, the exhibit went up in the five county high schools as well. So there was a private donation and uh, it's, a, it's a smaller version of the exhibit, but it's up in the five county high schools as well. So we're actually in all the schools now, I think, around so far. We keep... Nice, thank you. Um, and we have a question from Teresa with the Harrisonburg Reparations Group. And Teresa, I'm gonna try and phrase this so that we might actually get an answer that relates to our project. Um, go ahead and pop into the chat if you wanna clarify. Um, but Teresa says that there's a mural painted on the parking garage of the Federal Alley, um, but it depicts Lucy Sims as more yellow instead of making her appear to be African-American. Um, so it sounds like she's wondering if it's possible to repaint the mur mural to achieve that accuracy in the history. Is that something that you guys think this project would take on or is that gonna be a separate type of thing? What does that look like in terms of this project? Well, I would say that mural was more of an abstract painting. Um, okay. Yeah, that that's what that was. Um, I mean, I, I can, I'll just say that piece on my end. Yeah, it was part of a competition, if I remember correctly. Wasn't that right, Dina? Wasn't there a competition for, uh, for, a pro for a mural somewhere in town and that one won it? And I think that would probably have to go back probably to, um, probably to the city, actually, I would imagine, would probably be the people to talk to for that, I think. Yeah, that uh, and that actually came- Downtown Renaissance, probably HDR yeah, as well. And, and the Arts Council, I believe, was part of that. That's a neat piece of history. Um, all right, another question from Mary Beth is, what efforts are being made to recruit Harrisonburg High School students, specifically BIPOC students, to become future K-12 teachers? Well, I could probably answer that question. Uh, that's a, a very important question. We are just starting um, at this point. We got a little bit waylaid by a pandemic, but we are uh, making a very strong effort now at, at diversity hiring. And one, we've hired a consultant to work with us on that. And one thing we're doing is we're looking at these um, students, uh, future teacher programs. And so I was just connected to your institution, the JMU, to look at that. There is a um, future teachers of color program there. So we're looking at models that we might be able to develop actually with our own students. So we're in the beginning stages, but we're moving forward with that at this point. That's awesome, thank you. Um, still along the lines of the school, um, we have a question from Kenneth Gibson, who's a drama teacher. Um, and they would like to know, uh, let's see, uh, if some of the traditions that were referenced in the panels in the exhibit, like the operettas, the doll theater, the ebony players, um, things like that, um, could be introduced into our city schools as a way to preserve the rich culture that came from the Lucy F. Sims School. What do you guys think of that? Well, I, I could, and maybe Mr. Moyers could add in, but I think that's a, or Mr. Burgess as well, I think that's a a wonderful idea. What we're trying to do here is activate and enliven and bring forward local history, local African American history, and certainly weaving that in wherever we can is important. And also when students get to do hands on creative projects, there's deeper learning involved. And so learning about history through the arts and through drama and this kind of thing is very important. So I think that that um, having students and, and again, Mr. Morris is the expert on, on what the students are are um, doing in the classrooms, but having them involved in that hands-on in looking at that history and, and you know, reviving that history, if you will, and then doing something with it, right? Not just putting it down on paper, which is very important, but also um, putting it into other forms, such as drama, such as literature of their own and so forth is very important because then they really own it right, then they really own what they've learned and they be, it becomes much more of an authentic learning experience. Mr. Moyers, do you wanna add anything to that? Um, sure, and um, I think 
I think there are, there are a couple things that, that fit in here. Um, one, we're, we're definitely making a, a concerted effort uh, statewide and locally uh, to try to incorporate more African-American history um, into our all parts of our curriculum. Um, and really focusing on, um, I should say, not just African-American history, but kind of all the different perspectives that are present in our school. Um, because as Dr. Richards alluded to earlier, um, it's a very white history, very white male history. And so uh, we know that there are other stories out there that aren't being told. And that's, um, that's, not, that's not beneficial to anyone to only hear one perspective in one way and just accept that this is how it is. So a few things that we're doing, um, we're, we're definitely working on, on getting more of those stories out there, more of the, the voices of, of, of what was happening in different areas. And I know I'm getting kind of away from the original question, but there's another question that I think I'm helping to answer as well with this. Um, but we're a few things that are happening uh, that, that some might not be aware of. Um, the uh, commission on the governor's commission on African American history um, just this year uh, sent out a whole bunch of edits to our, our U.S. history curriculum statewide uh, that finally is is putting African American history into the standards in a way that um, that isn't as as Mayor Reed said isn't just saying here, here are African-Americans, but it's always in a bad light, right? Uh, with some accomplishments and some of the, the history uh, of the African-Americans in, in our nation and in our state are now part of our standards. In addition, locally, uh, next year, we are offering uh, an African-American history course, um, which we're very excited about. Uh, but on top of that, we're also making sure that, that we're, we're giving students choice uh, which is something division-wide we're really talking about uh, that Dr. Richards was alluding to. Uh, instead of just, here's the assignment, research this one thing, um, we talk to the kids and say, all right, well, one, one of the things that uh, one of our teachers did this year was, what's missing from our history that you'd be interested in doing? And the kids just researched the things that they thought were missing. And that's great for everyone because that's, it's it's getting deeper. It, the, it's student interest, and it's getting all of those different unheard stories and histories out there. Uh, so I think it, the, the more and more we can do that, and and incorporating that into into English and in math and into science and all the different disciplines, not just history, um, and shining a light on all the all the things that are missing, um, it, it just makes for a more engaged. Uh, student body, I think, and, and a deeper and richer history. And, and just wanted to add in to that, uh, being in the schoolhouse, something that, that we have, uh, Mr. Corey Lamb and, and Ms. Um, Ms. Wilson, we have a BSU, Black Student Union. They do a fabulous job. Uh, the Black Student Union on the road collaboration, they do a great job of coming together and, and exposing our students to these different areas of uh, what is teaching and so forth. Uh, in regards to some of the, the, the things that Mr. Gibson had asked about things that was taking place at Sims that possibly could do here. The BSU, they put on a great talent show that uh, those students come out and perform. That was something I know my, my dad and relatives used to always talk about, oh, you should have seen back in the days at Sims. That talent show they used to have there. What, y'all used to have talent shows? <laughs> but it's just one of those things. And so that's something that, that we do. Uh, doesn't get as much marketing and publicity, but hopefully moving forward it will. But that's something that all community folks should come out. Black, brown, white, green, blue, it doesn't matter. But come and watch this talent show that these students put on. And I can just hear my, my older cousins and aunts and uncles talk about the talent show that used to be at Sims. And I think that's fabulous for those kids to get out their shell and do that. And then the other thing is, I know I used to teach a leadership class uh, at Harrison Murray High School. I would go down the history hallway and break down the history for them on those, on those photos as a part of that leadership class. And that was pretty cool. And I think moving forward, uh, we have a mentorship class at Harrisonburg High School. 
and then mentorship class, just so the community knows, we put the students into the different uh, businesses that we have partnerships with, and they get opportunity to see, as Dr. Richard has said about uh, education. Someone asked a question about education. Well, we have these students, black, brown, orange, green, yellow, all of them. We put them out there so they can explore and see the opportunities that are available for them. And, and that's the beautiful thing about also this project moving forward. This get, inspires them even a little bit more that, yes, I can reach this goal. And, and I think that as, as Mr. Moyers elaborate on getting more of that local history, something that I would suggest is getting more, unfortunately, because Ms. Reed and, and Ms. Morris, we don't lost a lot of family members that attended some school. I would love to see us get some of those folks and they're getting a little older now. Dad, I know you might be watching. I'm sorry. They're getting a little older, but let's bring them into the schoolhouse. Now, we can't put them up and, and, and give them a sub and bro, but let's set them down on the little panel. Right. Three or, three or they four still remember. They, they, they still remember. But you know what, Don? What Another thing that I would like to see is Sims, once this is when we get out the pandemic and we're at, able to gather again, right? Sims has a... a a stage. Sims has a uh, a gym, an auditorium with a stage. I would love to see Harrisonburg High School and Sims partner and maybe do a play or students do something up at Sims, right? Because our elders would love to see that because that brings back so many memories because that auditorium, that stage, that's where they had the pageants. That's where they had plays. That's where they had talent shows. That's where they had their school dances, right? They would love to have that activity again. Um, love to have it. Right, it, in Sims. And so that I would actually would uh, offer that as a suggestion. Maybe we could collaborate together on that. I'm taking notes, Mayor Reed. I'm taking <laughs> notes over here. I, I thought it was really powerful when I was at a teacher award ceremony and some third graders, I think it was, Kirk, correct me if I'm wrong, but third graders from Smithland had been involved in one of those hands-on authentic history projects. And they were asked the question that Mr. Moyers um, alluded to, what's missing from our history here in Harrisonburg? And they used... Um, it's a project that was related to a grant called Changing the Narrative, and they used VR goggles um, to construct historical narratives, kind of to look around the Sims uh, property and inside the school and so forth and reimagine what it was like for people then. And they actually were out in the hallway as we were going into the room that Mayor Reed is describing, the auditorium, but it was so powerful when those little children got up on the stage and sat there. And so I agree, let's do that. Let's do more of that. Sounds like we have some new goals, guys. Um, kind of along those lines, if anyone wants to add a little bit. Um, oh, keep in mind, we are about 15 minutes away from wrapping up. So we do have a number of other questions to get through. Um, but we have a question from Isaiah. And he asks, can you speak on the trajectory for the black community in Harrisonburg County Public Schools? If anyone wants to add to what we've already said. Well, that's a broad question. Um, I can address it, hope that I'm addressing it in the way that Isaiah is asking it. And that is that um, I put together, we put together a, an equity um, advisory council couple years ago when I came on board and we're looking at, I'm gonna use some words here that um, I may have to explain, but we're looking at deconstructing the meta narrative of whiteness in education generally um, and looking at, and, and what that does is, what we hope to do with that kind of work is we hope to elevate um, our students who have been marginalized throughout history that their communities have to elevate them um, and empower them and help them become central and 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 important in our in our system and so that kind of work um come, comes at us from all different angles and so there's an equity council doing that kind of work um many of the some of the folks on the panel um, are in our strategic planning process where that kind of that kind of discourse was central 
to it. So we recognize that they, that African Americans have and, and other persons of color have been marginalized in education generally. And we recognize that in Harrisonburg, we also have that problem. And so we're working locally to deconstruct that narrative. And I don't know if that's what Isaiah is asking about, but that's um, one, I think one feature of what he may be asking about. Very cool, thank you. And Isaiah puts in the chat, yes. So good job. Um, we have a question from Joe, um, who wants to know, is there any part of the project or the story that includes the years after desegregation when the school, the, I'm assuming the Lucy F. Sims school, um, was used to segregate students with disabilities? This might be a question for Sean or Molly. Yeah, um, you know, there are so many stories that need to be told. Um, we touch on it briefly in the exhibit, primarily um, focusing on the loss of the building, the period in which the building felt lost to the Northeast neighborhood community, the local black community, um, a building that had been so central um, to so many community events. Um, after integration, that, that school was closed um, and there was a real sense of loss um, from the um, former SIM students that we spoke to and worked with. Um, we do talk as we, so we mention the way that the building was used in those intervening years. We also talk about the period when I think in the 1980s, the building started to then be used by the SIMS reunion committee um, as a space to gather. And it's used now as a community center, became a community center and is used um, and became used in that way again, but again, but without that connection to its past, which is what our exhibit tried to, to, to draw a link between. Don might want to chime in on this. The, uh, that's, that school was our community center when, when we were growing up. Um, when we were young, that school was still, um, it was our, our community center, like Westover Community Center is. That was our community center. That's where we went after school. Uh, that's where we hung out. That's where we... Uh, well, they played basketball inside there and outside there. That was our place. Um, Don, I know you I know you want to chime in on this one because I, I think you were hanging out there. Yeah, yeah. most definitely. Most definitely. <laughs> and actually, the, the basketball courts outside were on the corner of Washington Street and Sims Avenue, where the parking lot is. There was two courts that ran uh, uh, east-west there. And we would play there numerous. I cannot even count the number of high-and-go-seat games. Uh, that, that went on at the Sims. Inside, you had a, when it got cold, of course you went inside. Uh, Mr. Dunk, Marcella, Cardi, uh, then it goes on and on in regards to the ones that oversaw and looked after us. And they were our cousins. That's what Dina and, and Ms. Morris, we up there, they were our cousins. But that, that was our safe haven. That was the spot where we, our social skills, that, that's in the, the stage that Dr. Richard, that you've been in there for meetings that, that Ms. Reed, Mayor Reed was talking about. The knuckleball table was up there. Yeah. I remember people playing knuckleball. And if you all that don't know what knuckleball is, y'all, that's one of the best games there is working on your hand-eye coordination, your mm -hmm. communication skills. And that is something that used to be up in the Northeast neighborhood. Not just one ball, two, three, and you expanded to seven and eight balls up there and you're hitting the ball. And then the ball were rolling to the basketball court. And I get excited about talking about this because that was our community center. All right. And then I was a young head. When the street lights came on, the old heads would whistle, youngins, time for y'all to go. Nah, we want to hang out a little bit. And they would chase us home. Now, I'm not going to say their names, but they might be on here watching. But they would chase <laughs> us home. But we know when the street lights came on, it was time for me to go to the bottom of Kelly Street. Everybody dispersed, Myrtle, Broad, beautiful. And so when Sam School came back to us, came back for us, and uh, for us to utilize, it was beautiful. And the thing is, people from other, across the tracks that they would say would come over and play with us. And y'all don't know how powerful that was when we would come to middle school, all right, in the early eighties or elementary school in the late seventies. Hey, I was playing high and go seat with Don Don and Peanut and Clarence and all them. And then we're in school, it's just like, okay, yeah. So that friendship and that bond, that was that connector, that was that, that, that connector for us all through the city. And, and I thought that was very cool. Cause like Dina said, that was our Westover. 
You mm -hmm. even had our own our black pool up there. Had our own pool. We had sure a swim did. pool up there that a lot of people don't realize is there because it's been filled in and knocked down and so forth. Had our own swimming pool. And 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 those are the stories, um, and the um, pain, um, and the truth that we have to continue to tell about our neighborhood um, because it's it was always a vibrant. That school has always been a vibrant place has always been our foundation, right? From generation, from Lucy F. Sims to our, our great grandparents, to our parents, to us. You know, it, it was, we didn't go to school there. Colleen and Don and I, and I know Stephanie Howard is the supervisor of Sims now and she's watching. Uh, we didn't go to school there, but we were always connected because even though it wasn't a school anymore, it became our community center. And so it was still part of our community and part of our families. Sim School and uh, Miss Lucy is part of our families. So this is, yeah, this is good. Wow, thank you so much. Um, we have a question from Misty who wants to know, um, is there any interest in capturing the literal voices of some of the elders as part of the storytelling versus the mostly visual exhibit that we have going on now. Um, we talked a little bit about um, Mayor Dina wanting to be the narrator with that QR code, um, but is there any plan for capturing more of those community voices? Well, there aren't just plans there, it's already happening. We're collecting a lot of oral histories as we're moving forward and we, we plan to do more. We're actually going to write an article together as well to because this, this project has got actually the, a, a bit of recognition nationally. We've been asked by a journal to, to write about uh, the, how we put it together and uh, the collaborations and, 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 the, uh, and the very stories that we're talking about here tonight. So there's that going on. And actually the website itself, I mean, we have lofty plans for where that would go, where not, it, it would be a place where anybody could upload materials and craft their own family histories and other, and it, history isn't just one story, right? It's, it's, it's multiple stories, it's multiple narratives. And, and we really wanna have it not just as a place where like a repository where the past is, but a living space where these stories are being told all the time. So yes, Misty, we are very much, um, um, we're, we're, we're very much trying to, to move beyond the exhibit to all sorts of history, all sorts of documents and, and all sorts of voices to do. And, and could I just add to that, that anyone working on that sort of thing, please bring students into that in terms of students being historians. I know for, for instance, the, um, the media students at Harrisonburg High School would love to record those voices and, and be involved in that, in that work. And it's so powerful for students to do real history. And, I, and, I, uh, and Mr. Morris won't be offended by this because he agrees that real by real history i mean not just sitting and reading the history but doing it going out there and doing it so great opportunities for our students right and that's important and that's what we're supposed to do right because that's you know in our culture that's what how we learn we sit at the feet of our elders we learn from our elders so there's a lot of our elders still um, alive and and can tell the stories and so it will be it would be impactful to have our young people from the school to learn from the actual elders of the community and the former students of, of Sims, and they would love that. Yeah, I was just gonna, um, I was gonna tell Sean and Molly, we, we need to talk some more um, because I was actually talking to, uh, to Bo from Rockingham County and he's the, the supervisor in Rockingham about just such a thing and how can we collect some of these voices. Um, so as we're, we're teaching our history, we have this repository of, of stories, of oral histories, of whatever uh, that we can get, that we can expose our students to those and, and make those connections and, and tie that, really embed that into our curriculum. So that's yeah, exciting. Yeah. And just want to mention something, as Dina said, uh, we learn from being at the foot of the bed, listening to these stories. Uh, something that I would suggest as well is uh, taking some, some of the stories. Now I can just think biblically of my cousins, Roscoe Burgess and Ronald Burgess and uh, Charlie Thomas, and it goes on and on in regards to how 
locally how they blended in when they went to Sims in kind in primary schools, and then when the segregation happened, you know they they went to their respective schools just to get that side of the story. So then our students, so our students can realize how much they went through, how much sacrifice they went through, and then because uh, case in point, I still when Mr. Moyers had the the history hallway lined up with some of the posters. There was a, a little issue going on with one of our students with attendance and so forth. I got the young man walk. I said, come on, let's go for a walk. Mentioned to the admin, say, I got this one. Let me talk to him. Took him up there and showed him. Showed him the photo up on the wall. Let me tell you a little bit about, you know, that person right there? Now, who is that? Oh, well, that's your great grandmother. Huh? I didn't even know. Well, let me tell you something that she had to go through. And, you know, I don't know what it was, but I'm thankful and proud to say that the light bulb went off of that young man. That young man's doing big things now. I don't know if it was my conversation. That was only 1% of it. The 99% was him. But the fact that I know that, that turned on that light bulb. And I think if these students, our students, not just Harrison City Public Schools, Rockingham County Public Schools, all over the state, hear some of these folks and their stories. And they're like, wow. And that's like my third or fourth cousin right there. And I'm hearing this. I think that empowers them more. But more importantly, like Dr. Richard says, that's that history lesson that we need to give. All right, that's the history lesson that, that I think that's so powerful uh, for, for all of our kids, so. There's one picture that I have to say before we leave. There's one picture on that panel that I always go to when I watch, when I go through that exhibit. And there's a picture of a shop class, right? And it's all black males, you know the one. And they're all in dress slacks, uh, dress shirts, right, ties, suspenders, and they're in shop class. That's Sim school. That's how our elders, they went to school like that. Like they were going to church, they went to school like that. And that's the pride and the dignity that our elders have and they have instilled in us, they have passed down. And that started with Miss Lucy, right? And it just passed down from generations to generations to generations. And I know we have to go, but I want to reiterate, my dad, I remember leaving the house one time and I had like some shorts on and now holy jeans or holy sweatpants is like the, the thing. And he said, Don Don, where are you going? Mom and dad both, Don Don, where are you going? Well, I'm go, we're going to the store, aren't we? Uh-uh, look, you can put something else on. And I didn't see the big picture. And he told me, he said, look, you tall, you're black, and you're from Kelly Street. Put on what you need to put on and look presentable. And that goes back to what Ms. Dean Reed said. That was his mindset and their mindset when they went to school and so forth. So that's just that pride thing. And um, I just wanted to add on to that. Yeah, thank you for everyone sharing your stories. This is what this is about, right? Um, all right, we do only have like two minutes left. Um, there are two questions that I think have some pretty like one sentence answers. Um, and then we'll wrap up. Um, Robin wants to know if there are any resources or parts of the exhibit that are geared toward elementary school students. Um, in kindergarten, we learn about our Harrisonburg community and they would love to include and highlight Miss Sims. So that could be a quick yes or no. Do we have resources like that? Mr. Moyers. So yes, um, one of the things that um, we're, t we're talking about doing um, is the now that we have this permanent exhibit in um, in Harrisonburg High School, taking that um, for lack of a better way of saying it, the the mobile exhibit, if you will, uh, that used to be hanging up on the wall, and um, having that available to to our other schools, so then they can use some of those lessons and things that that we do have on on the website. Um, the then they could look at the exhibit in, in a, some way or shape or form just within their classroom uh, and then use some of those uh, some of those lessons that are there. And Molly and Sean, you're gonna have to refresh me. Um, we had some things that were re related to Virginia studies, I believe, um, on, in the well, elementary piece. I, I believe students did middle school and high school. I don't think that we did we any didn't. elementary school. school. But yes. room for expansion. Yeah. There you go. 
Okay. Um, with that, there are some other questions, but um, they tend to be source questions. So we do actually have an archive for all of the files and different resources that we've used on the project. And that can be found at, um, Sean, do you wanna give us the- I, That can be found in Google when you put in celebrating Sims mm -hmm. and it'll be the first thing. That's the easiest way to do it. <laughs> Google you will tell you. <laughs> yeah, and you'll find our archive there if you wanna look through any of the photos or different newspapers that have been shared with us from the community. Um, well, for I'll say real quick that um, there was a fire. So a lot of the records of the school were lost. So most of the photos from the exhibit came from private collections. They came from former SIM students, private photo albums and family photo albums. Yeah. Yeah. So timely work on the project then. Oh, thank you, Dr. McCarthy. The link is in the chat for everyone if you want to see that. Um, Just, can we get to Mark's question? Because I'd be interested whether people know whether there were ever yearbooks done at the SIM school or a student paper other than the chatterbox? Are they existing Are they existing anywhere and could they be accessed? That's Mark Sallon from, from EMU. Hi, Mark. Anybody know? No. We'll keep looking, Mark. Yeah, I don't know that question. I, that's something that we need to ask one of our elders because I don't, I don't know. Okay. If we do find it, then it'll be in that archive eventually. We'll get it. Oh, I see somebody saying yes. All right, it sounds like we need to connect with Teresa. <laughs> for now, in this, for the sake of time, um, I really don't wanna end this conversation. I don't think any of us do, but um, out of respect for you guys, we're gonna go ahead and close. So thank you everyone for participating and attending. Um, we've loved hearing your stories and sharing them. And thank you to Harrisonburg High School for installing the exhibit to the Virginia Humanities for their generous support, and to the many people at JMU for their support of this project over the years. And most of all, to the nearly 60 community partners without whom this celebration of Miss Sims, the school, and black education in Harrisonburg and surrounding counties would not have even been possible. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about the exhibit, it is open to the public at the Lucy F. Sims Center for Continuing Education in Harrisonburg and online. Um, at that link that Dr. McCarthy provided in the chat. Um, like he said, simply Google celebrating Sims and you can find a lot of what we talked about today. So thank you so much to everyone and we hope you have a lovely rest of your day. <laughs> Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ember. Thank you, Ember. Bye, Colleen. Thanks. <laughs>